Welcome. In this video, we will be discussing about the foundations of economic analysis. The following are the objectives of the presentation. 1. Discuss what economic analysis is. 2. Examine the different economic models. 3. Compare approaches in investigating economic phenomena. And 4. Discuss the role of markets. Let us first know what economic analysis is. Economic analysis refers to evaluating costs and benefits to check the viability of a project, investment opportunity, event, or any other matter. In other words, it involves identifying, evaluating, and comparing costs and benefits. It involves assessing or examining topics or issues from an economist's perspective. Economic analysis is the study of economic systems. It may also be a study of a production process or an industry. The analysis aims to determine how effectively the economy or something within it is operating. It could also be an investigation into a manufacturing process or an industry. The goal of the analysis is to identify how well the economy or a component of it is performing. Thus, the monetary appraisal of alternatives for achieving a specific goal is known as economic analysis. Let us now look at the two approaches in understanding the economic phenomena, the empiricism and rationalism. An empiricist argues that knowledge primarily comes to us from the five senses. Historical investigation, which involves using knowledge of historical events to help explain economic phenomena, is also usually empirical. The Great Depression of the 1930s, major wars, changing roles of women in the workforce, the invention of computers, and the financial crash of 2007 to 2008, all are examples of historical events that have had a significant economic impact. Induction is crucial in empirical analysis because it allows us to make generalizations or draw conclusions based on specific observations or data. In empirical analysis, we often collect data or observe specific instances, and through induction, we infer broader patterns or principles that apply beyond those specific cases. For example, if we observe that every time we drop an object, it falls to the ground, we can use induction to generalize that all objects will fall when dropped. This principle, derived from specific observations, forms the basis of our understanding of gravity. In empirical analysis, induction helps us formulate hypotheses, theories, and models by generalizing from observed data which we can then test further through additional observations or experiments. It's a fundamental tool for building our understanding of the world based on evidence and observation. Empirical investigation is useful in studying relationships between economic variables. If two economic variables seem empirically related to each other such that they fluctuate together, it might be tempting to think that changes in one variable are causing changes in the other. But two variables may also be related empirically without there being a well-defined causal relationship between them. Correlation does not necessarily imply causation. Rationalism, on the other hand, argues that our senses are not a reliable source of knowledge and instead directs us to look to reason and logic to find knowledge. In fact, a dedicated rationalist would argue that observation and the use of other senses is simply not necessary. For example, if we accept as a premise that all people are mortal and Juan de la Cruz is a person, then logical deduction dictates that Juan de la Cruz must be mortal. There is no requirement to wait around for many years to empirically observe Juan de la Cruz's death as logic and reason tell us that if our premise is correct and our reasoning is logical, then our conclusion must be correct. Rational investigation is an analysis based on abstract thought and the use of logic and reason. Rationalism can be particularly useful for determining causation between variables. Economists tend to use a rationalist approach to create theories based on assumptions about economic agents, from which, with careful reasoning, they draw out potential implications for economic behavior. A rationalist approach to pursuing knowledge can be very useful, but rationalism has its limitations. If your initial premise is not accurate, then your conclusion is unlikely to be correct. Now let us talk about economic theory. A good economic theory is thus informed by empirical evidence as well as rationalist investigation. Theory is about simplification. Simplification is complex and uncertain task. This leads to competing and disagreeing theories. Theories give rise to models. We now move to models. A model is an analytical tool that highlights some aspects of reality while ignoring others. In economics, what is ignored is often a portion of the larger historical, social, and environmental context. A model can take the form of a simplified story, an image, a figure, a graph, or a set of equations, and it always involves simplifying assumptions. An important part of many models is the assumption of ceteris paribus. In order to focus on one or two variables, we assume that no other variables change. Theories and models essentially simplify reality. Simplified models can help economists understand the working of very complex real-world economies. One popular economic model is the basic neoclassical model. It is a model that portrays the economy as a collection of profit-maximizing firms and utility-maximizing households interacting in perfectly competitive markets. This is portrayed in a circular flow diagram, presented in the next slide. 
The neoclassical model is an economic theory that focuses on how individuals and firms make decisions in markets. It assumes that people act rationally to maximize their own satisfaction or profits. In this model, households make decisions based on rational choices to maximize their utility, satisfaction, given their constraints, such as income and prices. The firms aim to maximize profits by choosing the optimal combination of inputs, such as labor and capital, to produce goods and services. Meanwhile, the markets are assumed to be competitive, meaning many buyers and sellers interact freely, and prices are determined by supply and demand. The model emphasizes the importance of factors like competition, rationality, and equilibrium in understanding economic behavior and outcomes. Overall, the neoclassical model provides a framework for analyzing how households and firms allocate resources and make decisions in market economies. Circular Flow Diagram, a graphical representation of the traditional view of an economy consisting of households and firms engaging in exchange. Utility, the level of usefulness or satisfaction gained from a particular activity, such as consumption of a good or service. Factor Markets, markets for the services of land, labor, and capital. And Product Markets, markets for newly produced goods and services. The circular flow diagram is useful in portraying, in a very simplified way, two of the major actors, households and firms, and three of the major activities, production, exchange, and consumption, involved in economic life. Now let us take a look at the contextual model. The economic activity is also influenced by social and environmental context. All economic production requires the input of natural resources and generates some waste. The economy operates in an environmental context. The economy also operates in a social context created and maintained by human beings. This includes history, politics, culture, ethics, and other human motivations. The social context determines what constitutes acceptable economic activity. The economic activity occurs in three spheres. These are the core sphere, the business sphere, and the public purpose sphere. The core sphere includes households, families, and community institutions that undertake economic activities, usually on a small scale and largely without the use of money. Important economic activity occurs within the core sphere. This includes the following. The primary site for raising children, preparing meals, maintaining homes, organizing leisure time, and caring for individuals who are sick, elderly, or needy but not in institutions such as hospitals or nursing homes. Activities in core sphere respond not only to wants, but also to needs. Core sphere activities are sometimes described as non-economic or non-productive because they generally do not produce goods and services for trade through a market. But this can be misleading. Consider the activity of providing care to family members. According to a 2015 analysis, the estimated economic value of this unpaid labor in 2013 was $470 billion. A different study found that the value of unpaid care work by women in the United States was even higher, at $1.5 trillion per year. Meanwhile, the public purpose sphere include governments and other local, national, and International organizations established for a public purpose beyond individual or family self-interest and not operating with the goal of making a profit. It has two economic functions, regulation and direct provision. One very basic function of public purpose organizations is to regulate economic activities, that is, to set the standards and rules of the game by which other economic actors play, so as to create the legal, informational, and social infrastructure for economic activity. Direct public provision is often used to supply goods or services that cannot be supplied equitably or efficiently by core sphere institutions and businesses alone. Some of the goods and services provided by the public purpose sphere are what economists call public goods. A public good or service is a good whose benefits are freely available to all, non-excludable, and whole use by some does not reduce the quantity available to others, non-rival. The business sphere is made up of firms that are expected to look for opportunities to buy and manage resources in such a way that, after their product is sold, the owners of the firm will earn profits. Whereas the core sphere responds to direct needs, and the public purpose sphere responds to its constituents, business firms are responsive to demands for goods and services, as expressed through markets by people who have the resources to buy the firm's products. The informal sphere is composed of market enterprises, normally small in scale, operating outside government oversight. Although this sphere could be classified as business because it involves private production for sale, it is also like the core sphere in that the activities are very small scale and often depend on family and community connections. Economic activities in the informal sphere may be illegal, as in the case of illicit drugs or prostitution. Other informal sphere activities are legal but do not appear in GDP statistics, such as house cleaning services provided off the books. Barter transactions are also part of the informal sphere. Let us now look at the role of markets. Market is a physical place or web location where there is a reasonable expectation of finding both buyers and sellers for the same product or service. 
the interaction of buyers and sellers defined within the bounds of broad product categories, such as the market for used cars or the real estate market, an economic system, a market economy that relies on markets to conduct many economic activities. One alternative to a market economy is a system that relies on central planning to conduct economic activities, as was the case in the Soviet Union. China retains many elements of a central planning system, though the role of markets in China has expanded significantly in recent decades. But even in modern market economies, not all activities are structured by markets. For example, the distribution of resources within the core sphere is mainly based on social or family relationships. And decisions about resource management are often based on scientific evidence or political preferences rather than market forces. An institution refers to a formal or informal rule that structures human interactions. They include laws, customs, norms, routines, and operating procedures. In other words, they encompass everything from a national constitution to table manners. Organizations, for example, a hospital, are sometimes called institutions, but it makes more sense to consider organizations as sets of institutions. Many institutions help markets work more smoothly. For example, credit cards are an institution that facilitates purchases without the use of cash. Consumer protection laws are an institution that defines certain exploitative business practices as illegal. The ability to return purchased items for a refund can also be viewed as a widely accepted institution. Here are the classification of institutions that facilitate the function of markets. Institutions related to property and decision-making, social institutions of trust, and money as a medium of exchange. Thank you.